We're conducting this interview at the 2013 Ripcord Association reunion, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We're talking to Peter Sent of Dover, Delaware, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Peter, can you begin with some background and start with where and when were you born? I was born uh, August 27, 1948 in Dallas, Texas. Okay, did you grow up there? No, I actually lived there for about a year or two, and then uh, my family uh, relocated to North Jersey and then very quickly out to California, and then back to North Jersey. And I grew up in North Jersey, in Bergen County, New Jersey, in a town called Ridgewood. All right, and what did your family do for a living those days? My father was a textbook publishing executive mm -hmm. um, with a number of different publishing companies. And uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, he got transferred a lot. And mm -hmm. that's why we wound up in Texas when I was born back in North Jersey, which was the home office for his company, Prentice Hall. Mm -hmm. And then he was West Coast, uh, he was in charge of sales, textbook sales on the West Coast, while we wound up in California, and then back when he was promoted to uh, Vice President of Sales for Prentice Hall. All right, and when did you finish high school? Finished high school uh, June of 67. Okay, now uh, what did you do once you got out of high school? Um, Went to college for a year at uh, Morris Harvey College in Charleston, West Virginia. Majored in drinking and chasing women. And caught mono and lasted exactly one year. And my father brought me home and said, uh, you're going to school at Fairleigh Dickinson for a year. If you don't get all straight A's, I'm not paying for any more college. So I went to Fairleigh Dickinson University in Wayne, New Jersey for a year. Uh, wound up with uh, the equivalent of a B plus average. Mm -hmm. He said, I meant what I said. And I said, okay. Without telling anybody, I went down to an Army recruiter, and I said, show me what you got. And we went over it, and I, the intelligence field looked interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I enlisted, and that would have been a 90-day delayed enlistment, so that would have been March of 69. Okay. Went home, and sat at the dinner table, right. and said, I enlisted. Now, at this point, you know, the Vietnam War has been going on, and certainly in the news. How much did you know about Vietnam at that point? Quite a bit. Quite a bit. I had followed it. Okay. Uh, and so you're, when you enlist, you're expecting there's a pretty good chance that's where you're going to wind up going. I volunteer. Okay. All right. And now, to go in, into intelligence work, do you have to score a certain level on tests, or do you do that before you go in, or how does I did work? take a test uh, just to make sure that I was at a level that I would be accepted. Right. Okay. So you're going to qualify for that and you get a 90 day delay before you start. So you're going in in June. Uh, where do you go for basic training? Fort Dix. Okay. So you stay in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and, and what was the, what was basic like there? What did they do? What was the atmosphere there? Everything was geared for Vietnam. You know, um, you got to take this 20 mile hike because it's what you're going to be doing in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You better learn how to shoot this weapon properly because it's going to save your life when you get to Vietnam. You better learn this. It's going to, you know, this discipline will be invaluable and mm -hmm. save your life in Vietnam. Everything was geared to Vietnam. All of our drill instructors, um, all of the cadre were Vietnam veterans. And uh, they did a lot to get you ready for Vietnam. But that was just basic training. So. Okay. And that actually is, is different from what a lot of guys report, because often they're basic doesn't always get geared for that. Uh, also, did you have any sort of 90-day wonder sergeants who were helping out in the training, guys who hadn't gone anywhere yet? No. Okay. So you're not seeing any of them? No, I did not see any of them. But the only, I mean, the company clerk may have been an E3, a PFC. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember any, very few corporals or spec fours. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think because they were all over, over in Vietnam. Very few sergeants. Everything was E6 and above. Okay. So all guys who've been there and come yes. back. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to military life? Growing up, my father was a disciplinarian. My father's idol was George Patton. Mm -hmm. uh, my father fought in World War II with the 5th Infantry Division and was wounded in combat. And the greatest disappointment of his life was that he never got to go to West Point. Mm -hmm. So my father was a disciplinarian. The ability to adapt to discipline, mm -hmm minor. Yep. I had very few problems uh, getting along. Mm -hmm. Now was that unusual for the men you were training alongside? Did they have more trouble than you did? 
You know, it, it, it's, I can't say that. I can't say that. Uh, I don't remember a lot, but I can't say that. It was all pretty much, okay. we're all a group. All right. And were a lot of the draftees? Or do you not know? I believe about 60% were draftees. Okay. And what kind of attitude did they seem to have? The draftees? Yeah. I got to do it. I want to do it. And I want to get home alive. Okay. So they are kind of getting with the program and, and doing that. Right. Now, uh, now, being from New Jersey and being at, at Fort Dix, did uh, you get any occasion to ever go off the base during basic, or do, you, do they just keep everyone there together? You know, I don't remember ever leaving the base mm -hmm. at Fort Dix and going into Wrightstown or whatever. Uh, I'd have, I remember, a couple weekends near the end of training where I was allowed to have visitors down, mm -hmm. and we had freedom of the post. In other words, we'd go anywhere on yep. post we yep. wanted to. Uh, I remember that, but no, I don't remember going off okay. base at Fort Dix. All right. And how long was basic? Uh, eight weeks. Eight weeks, okay. And then what do they do with you next? I was assigned to uh, training for intelligence okay. at Fort Holabird, Maryland. All right. And what sort of program was that like? How would you describe that? It was different much more relaxed discipline wise than what we had at um, at Fort Dix um, very little weapons training I mean none uh, very little survival training this was training for you to do a job um, analyzing I was initially I was a combat order of battle intelligence analyst in 97 uh, uh, 96 B 96 Bravo and the basic job was analyze what the enemy, what you were facing, mm -hmm. and present that picture to the commander. Right. Our instructors were from all different branches. I remember a Marine captain we had, Captain McKenzie, was just incredible. What a great guy. Um, you know, we lived in a barracks and had to go through inspections, of course, and all of that, but it was much, much more relaxed. Mm -hmm. So it's really largely classroom work and... Yes. Yeah, and that's yes. Okay. Uh, and, and how long did that program go? I think that was also eight weeks. Okay. So, I think that was also eight weeks. Okay. I'm not 100% sure. But okay. But anyway, it's not significantly longer than basic was no. if it was longer at all. It might have been 12, but. Yeah. All right. And then, uh, then I was volunteered for something called Shake and Bake. Um, instant NCO. Mm -hmm. And I remember the pitch that the major made to us. He said, only the top 10% of this class will be accepted for um, the program. I can't remember the official name of the program, but whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I was number two or three in the class. And uh, he said, what you need to understand is you'll go through this program, you will come out on E5. And you're, I remember this, you're going to be shotgunned all over the world. Some go to Germany, some go to Alaska, some go to Korea, some may go to Greece, some may go to uh, Vietnam, obviously, mm -hmm. some may stay here in the States. And of course, it was a 16-week program, and when we all graduated, every single one of us went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So it was like a shotgun on a full choke right up a map of Vietnam. And the guys I went was in class with were spread all the way from, I guess I was the furthest north, all the way down to the southern part of South Vietnam. Okay. So now, did you do the NCO training? Yes. Okay. So you did take that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And did they do that there? They at at Holabird? That so at Holabird. No, that was that was very very interesting because we got to do things that uh, were different. There was an island out in uh, the harbor in Baltimore that uh, a lot of the undercover operations used, and we got to work with that. Um, do some swimming, get on the island, and it was set up as a Vietnamese village mm -hmm. and um, learned what to look for and what to ask. And we had, because of my job, I had training in interrogation, I had training in uh, aerial reconnaissance, how to read map, uh, read photographs, and a little bit of everything, which was really kind of cool, how to set up an agent network and so on. So it was interesting. All right. And about how long was that program? That was 16 weeks. Okay. So by the time you finished that, uh, around what date is that now? May. May of 70. Okay. May of 1970. And you've gotten through all of that 
Um, now, have you gotten any leaves home along the way, or have you just been going from base to base? Uh, just, just weekends. Okay. You know, Baltimore wasn't that far from North Jersey, and on weekends I'd hop a train and go home. All right. So now that you've completed all of this, uh, will your next stop be Vietnam? or they... My next stop was Vietnam. Okay. And did you get to leave home first? Yes, I got 30 days at home. Okay. All right. And then how do they physically get you out to Vietnam? Um, I had to report to McGuire Air Force Base, and uh, I think it was a World Airways DC-10, I think. Mm -hmm. And we flew to, it might have been McCord, when I'm McGuire to McCord, I think. Mm -hmm. Then to Alaska, then to Yakota Air Base, Japan, mm -hmm. and then to Benoit. All right. And what's your first impression of Vietnam? It smelled horrible. And it was hot and it was wet. All right. And did you land during the day or at night? I think we landed at night because I remember seeing flashes in the clouds as we mm -hmm. were going in and wondering whether that was thunder or artillery. All right. And you land at Benoit, get out in the hot and the wet and so forth. What do they do with you? Put you in a, we were in a hooch, and well, it was like a barracks, mm -hmm. and you know, I wasn't there for a day or two, right. and my orders were cut for headquarters, headquarters, S2, headquarters, and headquarters company, 3rd Brigade. Okay, and for the uninitiated, what does S2 stand for? That's the intelligence office. You have right. five offices, G1, S1 at a below a division level, G1 at a division or above mm -hmm. level. Uh, S2 is intelligence, S3 is operation, right. S4 is supply, mm -hmm. S5 is psyops, and S1 is personnel. Right. Okay. Uh, so you're going, and so you train intelligence, and, and that is what they're going to do with you. They're going to send you up. Okay. And so uh, where are you based first? Um, went into, um, I guess we flew into Fubai, because mm -hmm. the landing strip at Evans wasn't big enough, and then uh, probably trucked, uh, trucked me up to Camp Evans. Okay. Now, did they do a kind of an orientation thing for the division when you got there, the CERTS training or yeah, something? Yeah, I went through CERTS, Screaming Eagle Replacement Training Center, okay. uh, school, whatever. Yeah. And uh, that was kind of cool. That was four or five days, I can't remember. And then shipped me out to the S2 office. Okay. And the CERTS training, was some of that stuff new to you? Yeah, uh, repelling. I had never repelled. I learned how to repel. Mm -hmm. And you had to. Everybody in the division had to know how to repel. Yeah. So that was kind of new different. Okay. And did they make much of an effort to teach you anything about just life in Vietnam and how to deal with the locals? As I remember, yes. A little bit. A little bit. Um, it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. All right. Uh, so you finished that and now you're assigned to the headquarters that are right there at Camp Evans, at least, is where you're based. So um, when you get first go and join the unit, uh, what sort of reception do you get? What do you have to do? Well, I remember one of the first tasks that uh, Major Andre, who was the S2, asked me to do was to do a combat order battle intelligence analyst. He said, I want you to go through all these reports. And there were uh, radio intercepts. There were POW reports. There were um, net agent network reports. There were sightings, aerial photography reports. So I had all of these reports mm -hmm. in front of me. Uh, my recollection is that I was the only trained intelligence person in the brigade. Okay, I had two E7s above me. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if there was, at that time, if there was a captain above me or not. And then Major Andre. Mm -hmm. And I went through and I did, you know, with the, with the acetate over the map and the little marks as to who was where and who was there. I remember doing that and my jaw fell open. What were you seeing? Um, saw Ripcord with the second 506, I had mm -hmm. an artillery yeah. based at Ripcord. Uh, second 506, as I recall, was what they referred to as a reinforced battalion. In other words, it had an extra company mm -hmm. and it had the artillery and support. Mm -hmm. And around it were two brand new, fresh NBA divisions at 110 to 120 percent strength. Okay. Now these were fresh. Mm -hmm. These were not B 
battle-weary troops. They were combat experienced, mm -hmm. but they were not, you know, they, it's like they'd had a month off and training and so on. In addition to the two full NVA divisions, there was, a, as I recall, there was an artillery regiment and a reinforced sapper mm -hmm. uh, company. Um, that's what, uh, there, there may have been more, I just don't remember. I mean, literally my jaw fell open because you're looking at 10 to 20,000 enemy mm -hmm. versus a battalion that's under strength yeah. to begin right. with. Uh, my, my recollection, and, and I, I may be totally wrong, my recollection is that 2nd of the 506 was between 60 and 75 percent strength. That's my recollection, and it's not gospel, but yeah. that's what and, I And then as you, you get in, in July, I mean, eventually you'll have companies with as few as 15 men in them. So, yeah, they were not in good shape. And, and my job, what they had me doing, was working a 12-hour shift at the Brigade Operations Center on the S-2 radio so that when things were at the absolute worst, mm -hmm. like when... That company in second five oh six got hit. I worked. I worked the radio that night. Mm -hmm. I heard all this on the radio. I called in the the uh, DC three. I can't remember what they called it. The flare ship. Mm -hmm. You know, they made the request through me. Bring in right. that. I, I, I can't remember what they called that thing. Yeah, but it, that provides the illumination. Beach ball or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah that dropped flares. All right. Um, uh, did you start up? Was it? Was it? Did you start on that duty in June or in July? June. Okay, so it's in June. So report is, I mean, it's the fully blown siege is right starting beginning of, of July, but there's a lot going on even in June, and then pretty quickly it, it, it accelerates and it, and it gets worse. What was the mood in, in, in the, your unit in the headquarters as this is going on? Are they acting like, you know, this is new and different, or were they being very no. businesslike? No, it was very businesslike, very businesslike. And it's one of the things that I appreciated about this unit, mm -hmm. you know, you get to a unit and you say, how's it going to go? Is everybody here for themselves with a single objective, mm -hmm. no matter what it takes to get home alive, or is everybody here for everybody else? Let's get the mission done. And that's the way this unit was. Mm -hmm. All right. And how much contact did you sort of have with, with higher ups beyond your, your major? I mean, did you see much of, of, of Colonel Harrison? Or oh, yes. Like that? Oh, yeah. I saw Colonel Harrison every day. Um, at one point, and I don't remember when it was, Colonel Harrison, I think, was up over the area. It was in late afternoon, and I was in the S2 mm -hmm. office. Westmoreland and Abrams came in. I don't know where Harrison was. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Westmoreland, I th had thought, had gone This home. was like, no, this was a change. But he was coming back for a visit. Yes. And or a change or something. I don't yeah, remember yeah. why, but they were both they there. They were both there. All right. And Creighton Abrams looked at me because I had to brief him on mm -hmm. from the intelligence yeah. standpoint. Nobody else was there. And he looked at me and he said, "Son, what would you do?" And I said, uh, "Sir, I'm a spec farm. You don't want to know what I'm going to do." He said, "I asked you a question." Mm -hmm. he, he said, "You're intelligent. What would you do?" I said, "Well." If it was up to me, I'd use tactical nuclear weapons and nuke the Asheville Valley and make it uninhabitable for anybody to be in there for the next 150 years. And he looked at Westmoreland and said, see, I told you. Mm -hmm. and I don't know what that meant. Yeah. Um, there were a couple times when I briefed Tennessee when he came in. Uh, he was not there during yeah. Ripcord. And that's the division commander. Correct. Uh, Sid Berry mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Olin e. Smith. Uh, I can remember sitting down with Olin e. Smith, who I thought was just a wonderful person. Okay. Now, what was his role? Barry was. Barry was assistant commander of the division. Uh, Olin e. Smith was the XO. Okay. Was the executive. One was XO and one yeah. was assistant division right. commander. Right. And I. Don't yeah. Remember and then, and which Barry was, was which. assistant commander. So yeah. yeah. But. Uh, Smith was cool. Smith had come up as an enlisted man, mm -hmm. all the way up the ranks, and he understood. And he could sit down with a Spec 5 or an E4 or, or whatever and just say, hey, what's going on? Um, the first week that I was with S2, it's an interesting story, because I'm Cherry mm -hmm. in country. I'm new. Yeah. Uh, Major Andre comes into the S2 one afternoon. He says, 
and he says, uh, Pete, you're going up in the Nighthawk tonight. The Nighthawk was a helicopter that ran the perimeter of mm -hmm. Camp Evans looking for infiltrators. Right. Sure. Okay. Yeah, what do I know? I'll do it. Put on my helmet, my flak jacket, and take my M16 and jump on the chopper as it starts to get dark. And we're running the wire, and uh, they see something down in the wire. And we have a Xeon searchlight on the chopper and a minigun. And uh, so they bank around, and the door gunner opens up with a minigun. Like miniguns do every time you fire them, it jammed. Mm -hmm. So the door gunner yelled at me, give me your 16. Well, he knows what he's doing. I don't know what I'm <laughs> doing. Here, take my 16. And I hear him tell the pilot, bank hard left. So the pilot banked hard left. And the door gunner lost his balance. Now, he was tethered, mm -hmm. but he still lost his balance. And he grabbed for the pole. And when he did, there goes my M16. About five or six hundred feet mm -hmm. down outside the wire. How do, how do you explain that? I mean, mm -hmm. what do you tell the, the armor at the company mm -hmm. when he says, where's your M16? Well, it's outside the wire. So, well, the next day, a bunch of guys went out and did get it, did recover the weapon. But that was my initiation to, you know, firing at somebody okay. and, and, and contact. And the other thing, the, the other point is back about a week before we evacuated Ripcord, one of the companies, and I think it was Alpha, 2nd to 506, was in a firefight. And they captured a weapon that had never been seen in South Vietnam before. And it was a Hungarian folding stock AKM, mm -hmm. modified AKM. And I remember Andre came in and he said, uh, Sam, you're running out to Ripcord and pick up this weapon. I knew what was going on, but you know, and yes, sir, I'll do what I'm told. And they got on the chopper. I was on a supply chopper, you know, mm -hmm. I went out there. And all I had to do was jump off, run into the operate to the talk, the operation center, grab the weapon, and come out. When I came out, the chopper's gone. And it was a day or two before they could get me off. Okay. So, what so was that's like? my underground experience with Ripcord, and it was the scariest couple of days of my life. Okay. okay, this is again about a mid July then a week about a week before yeah. they abandoned. Probably the place. between the fifteenth and the eighteenth, okay. somewhere in there. But before the artillery battery blew up. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So what was that couple of days like? How do you describe that? What were you scared to death. And what were you I was in the operation center. Okay. Uh, I think I spent almost every moment down there. Um, it was just like I say, it was cramped, it was hot. Um, you know, I, I, I worked the radio a little bit. Mm -hmm. I slept down there, you know, and, and then the next day they got me out. Okay. And what kind of feel did you have for the situation there? Did things seem to be under control as far as you could tell? Yeah, I mean, I had nothing to compare it to. And, you know, in retrospect, yeah, we were getting incoming. We were mm -hmm. getting, I don't know. 40 to 50 rounds a day of incoming mm -hmm. mortar and so on. Um, and I'm scared. I mean, sure, I'm scared. Anybody would be scared in that situation. Um, but you do what you have to do. And, you know, I wasn't a hero. I didn't do anything spectacular. Uh, I didn't fire my weapon. Um, I did what I was supposed to do. Right. And what impression did you have of, of the personnel there? The We're going to get the job done, mm -hmm. officer and enlisted men. Mm -hmm. You see, I that was the whole impression I got and still get mm -hmm. from every single person I talk to is um, they're proud, very proud of the unit, of the division, and the job that the people with this division have done mm -hmm. since its inception. I mean, all the way through World War II. Battle of the Bulge and all of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the attitude of McAuliffe when he said nuts mm -hmm. to the German commander. And, you know, it's part of what makes me extremely proud to have been a part of the history. I mean, I'm lucky as hell. Couldn't have been with a better unit. Okay. Now, one of the uh, interesting things about your experience is that you've got 
at least some sense, you get out in the field periodically, you've got some sense of what's that like. That's like, but you're also back uh, in the base areas. And a lot of people um, out of this unit and others say, well, life on, in, in the rear area was quite a bit different from what it was out on the fire bases and in the field. And they talk about issues with discipline, with racial tensions with drug use or things like that. Uh, how much of that, if any, did, did you observe? There's a lot of drug use. Mm -hmm. uh, personal observation, not a lot. Didn't do it, mm -hmm. didn't like it. Um, there were too many scary things about it. Oh. When you're in a situation where your life depends on your being able to react, and it's, I mean, we used to get incoming at, at Evans, too, mm -hmm. not on a regular basis. Um, there were people like in base defense to make sure that didn't happen real mm -hmm. often, and if it did, there was outgoing immediate, right. immediately. Um, drinking? Oh, yeah. I mean, when I wasn't after ripcord, when I wasn't on the, on the desk, yeah, I used to drink a fair amount. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, I was a kid. I mm -hmm. was 20, 21 years old, 22 years old. You know, a bunch of us get together and have a party. Mm -hmm. You but, drink. Okay. But not the sort of thing that interferes with being able no. to do your job. Oh, no. Yeah. And, 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 and I have to honestly tell you, and maybe this is naive, maybe it's because I didn't go looking for it, I didn't see any of that. Mm -hmm. I didn't, thank God. Um, I, I, and yeah, there were guys who said to me, hey, you want to try? No, I don't want to try. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. But you're also in a unit that's probably going to be sort of more highly trained and, and, and often in rank and things like that. Pick a group that you're with, a mo pretty motivated group too, and probably less likely to do any of that. I disagree with that because okay. many of the people that were in the headquarters company who worked mm -hmm. in the operations center and saw came out of the field. Okay. Um, we had another another guy, Cope, Steve Cope, who. I can't remember whether he was S3 or S2, but he worked the radio mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. and, and with me, so maybe he was S3. And he was in the area in the hooch right next to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, those guys, we hung around with the guys from base defense a lot. Mm -hmm. um, no. I They're didn't doing their it. job too. I didn't. And these were guys who had an infantry, had a combat background. Not mm -hmm. necessarily that they were ever shot at, mm -hmm. but they were trained in infantry combat, yeah. and I wasn't, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, Cope had been out in the field. Um, there's another guy who got, who died, who was in for a while, in, in the operations center. Um, Cope, Paul Cope. And I became very good friends with him, mm -hmm. even when he went over to the RNS platoon. No, I didn't see any of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah, I know it was there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think I remember once seeing a bunch of guys over in a cor over somewhere smoking marijuana yeah. or, or, or doing doing something. Mm -hmm. And I remember they were doing something else. And, and, and I, it's not something I wanted to get involved right. with because I wanted to get on. Because yeah. that is one of the things that, that I found striking in doing this is the degree to which units still function. Because you read all the stuff, and a lot of what's in, in the literature and so forth is, oh yeah, you know, the military is all falling apart and uh, and that kind of thing, and, and, and it, it's not fitting. I mean, you get incidents that happen in certain places, and often at home or in Germany, uh, but we're still functioning. Yeah, and I heard those stories too, especially about Germany. Yeah. I had no desire to go to Germany, none, because I didn't want any part of that culture. Okay, I was going to go back in here to, to what you are doing, experiencing now. Um, you spend, do you spend a full year in Vietnam? No. Um, I was short, I think, 40 days. Okay, but Somehow I came back a early May. Okay, but you still have got most of a year there. Yeah. Uh, and do you spend it all with the same basic assignment? All right. Um, kind of describe sort of the range of duties that you had over the course of the year. You listed some of them. What, what, what else? I would do briefings. Um, I would accumulate information from various sources. Um, I knew the division interrogators. Mm -hmm. There were times I'd go help with an interrogation. Um, I knew the guys from ASA, 
the Army Security Agency that do the radio intercepts. Mm -hmm. We affectionately call them the Army Softball Association because they aren't real soft. No. <laughs> um, did a lot of work with the RNS platoon because this, these guys were my eyes on the ground. Okay, and is that reconnaissance surveillance yes. or? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I went out with them two or three times uh, with Paul because mm -hmm. I wanted them to know what I wanted. Right. What's the best way for me to do that is to go out there, come upon a bunker complex and say, okay, here's what I want to know. This is how you can look to see if this is new or old, how recently it's been used. And so I went out a couple times with them. All right. Now, um, during the ripcord operation, one of the things that happens right at the end is, is that one of the companies of, of 2506 recovers a comma wire, communications wire. And they tapped into it. Yeah. And so were you kind of dealing with the information coming off of that? No. I was too new. All right. Okay. Um, that was going through other channels, and all I was getting was the reports. I knew we mm -hmm. had it. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it firsthand. I mm -hmm. saw it sanitized after people had looked at it. Right. Uh, and that's part of what helped me prove mm -hmm. what I did in late June, right? which nobody believed. Yeah. Um, Andre did not believe me. When I did my mm -hmm. order of battle intelligence anal uh, analysis, mm -hmm. when I got there, nobody believed me. That's what shook me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm trained to do this. This yeah. is what you want me to do. This way, Because I, I gave it to Andre, and he said, no, that's not right. He dismissed it. Okay. Uh, now, by the time they got the, the common wire intelligence, had, had he sort of started to come around? or I guess by then had there Don't been know. enough... Act Don't know. He was not an open person. Okay. Okay? And I was not the type that would have thrown it in his face and questioned right. him. Right. Right. I, I, I wouldn't do that. All right. Uh, so, so to a certain extent, so, so is it getting that intelligence at that state, that was still was something of a surprise, as far as you can tell, or, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. and then that becomes one of the factors that determines the decision to, to evacuate. I mean, General Harrison has talked about that and other things, but... Mm -hmm. the, the, the decision to evacuate, I mean, it was, in my opinion, and this is just as in E5, mm -hmm. in the intelligence, office at brigade level, and it's something I could never other understand. You either bring in another brigade mm -hmm. and dedicate the full efforts of the third brigade, meaning mm -hmm. both of the other battalions dedicated right. to that small area right now, or get out. Mm -hmm. And because of the political situation, my understanding is yeah. that because of the political situation, the decision was made mm -hmm. to get out, plus not, not just the political situation, but the tactical situation on Ripcord being what it was after the chopper crash, yeah. um, and the fact, and, and after, what was that, Alpha 2nd five or 6 got decimated? Mm -hmm. I mean... Well, they got they get chewed up when the decision's already been made. That's like the very last day is when... The night before. Yeah. That decision, the decision was, uh, you know, when the decision was made, I don't know. My assumption is it was made the morning of, early morning of the evacuation. Okay, that was, it was, because I remember sitting in the, in, in the talk that night, listening to them get chewed up mm -hmm. and, and calling in the beach ball, yeah. which was the, the, the flare drop thing. Right, right. Um, and I don't think a decision was made until 6 a.m. in the morning because the chopper had already crashed. Mm -hmm. And that's my recollection, and it may not be right, okay? But it's not too much before that. At least I'm mean, interviewed Fred Spaulding, who was involved with that, as well as John Harrison. And Great deal of respect for Fred. Yeah. The, the man really did a tremendous job. He and he and Her he and, and, and Colonel Harrison did mm -hmm. just a tremendous job <coughs> under the most unbelievable amount of pressure mm -hmm. that that anybody could ever imagine. What impression did you have of General Barry? Um, General Barry was a by the book, no deviation, and the expression we had was a strack asshole. Okay? 
General Berry was with the unit when 101st was up at Quezon. Really hot, 110 degrees, 100% mm -hmm. humidity. And I had heard a story about him being up there, visiting up there. And there were guys walking around without flat, flat jackets and just helmets. And he just ripped them and made them put on the take jackets and uh, flat jackets and in 110 degree heat. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way he was. He was a by the book. In my, this is in my, right, right. my opinion of him. Mm -hmm. General Smith, because of his background, yes. understood. It was like General Barry didn't understand. Mm -hmm. It's like, in any situation, there are two, maybe three ways to do things. The way the book says you do mm -hmm. it, and the way you do it in actuality, and then the right way to do it. Okay? General Smith was by the book. I'm sorry, Barry. General Barry was by the book. General Smith was the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay? So these are the things that that I remember, mm -hmm. that I saw. All right. And of course, both Harrison and Spaulding were also men up from the ranks. So there's kind of a pattern sometimes. Well, you see, at the time, I did not know that General Harrison mm -hmm. had enlisted in 46. Yeah. Um, I was the kind of guy who just... Because of my upbringing, you don't question. Mm -hmm. When somebody says, do this, you do it. Then if you want to question, you can question. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, now, describe what the, well, the interrogation sessions. Would these be with, with enemy prisoners mm -hmm. or whatever? And could you get useful intelligence from them? Oh, absolutely. Um, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. You've heard horror stories about torturing by Americans of POWs. Mm -hmm. You know, throwing people out of choppers and so. First off, you throw somebody out of a chopper, that's a source that you've just killed. Yeah. Yep. Okay? That doesn't make sense. Was it done? I don't know of one instance, but that's me. Mm -hmm. It may have been, but I don't know yeah. of any instance. The point is to describe what you Torturing? Saw. I never saw any torturing of prisoners. Uh, when I worked with the interrogation unit at the, at the division level, if we could not get what we, what we wanted from a prisoner, We'd go for a cup of coffee, and we would come back 15 minutes later, and this guy would tell us anything we wanted to know. Mm -hmm. How or why? I didn't see anything happen. Right. Did something happen? There's no question something happened. Did we do it? No, it was not us. It was the Arvins that did it, mm -hmm. and that's how we got information. All right. And, and what sorts of characters would be these are the ordinary soldiers you picked up? Or, yeah. 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 Viet Cong mm -hmm. and, uh, or VC. Right. And uh, NVA, a couple NVA regulars. Okay. Now, Ripcord gets evacuated on 22nd, 23rd of July there. Uh, and then what other things do you do after that? I mean, you mentioned being on a firebase called Nancy. That was later when right. when the Army of South Vietnam invaded Laos. Okay, Lamson 719. Exactly. Yeah. Fire support base Nancy was up on the road, nine clicks south of the DMZ. Mm -hmm. And it was on the road from Quang Tri to Quezon. Mm -hmm. And it sat right on the middle of that road, you know, the, that stretch. Um, that was kind of cool. We uh, shared it with the Arvins that mm -hmm. didn't go to Laos. Uh, it was an interesting experience, because by then that would have been spring of 71. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd been there a while. I yeah. knew what was going on. I knew the ropes and so on and so forth. Um, one of my jobs, including during Ripcord, mm -hmm. was to provide targets for arc lights, mm -hmm. which would be 52 strikes, provide targets for flame drops and beacon drops. Uh, I even went on a flame drop once, which was absolutely incredible. Um, a flame drop is where a loach which is one of those helicopters that looks like a yep. teardrop. Mm -hmm. um, flies a treetop level and finds a target. Meanwhile, you've got a Chinook with a sling load of 55-gallon uh, drums filled with food gas and a white phosphorus grenade. And what I used to look for was bunkers. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wanted to put a flame drop under bunkers because that food gas would run all down into it, mm -hmm. and that's what I wanted to happen. So when the RNS platoon went out and found a bunker complex, a, a one that was being used, which is why I had to go out with them. Right. 
Anyhow, did that. Um, and it was cool. One flame drop that I did, I found a bunker complex. I'm in the load. <coughs> what I did was call to the nearest unit. Remember, I knew where all our people right, were. Right. So I knew who was near, nearest that point. And I said, pop smoke. So I want to know where they are. I don't want mm -hmm. the Chinook putting the flame drop on our guys. Right. So I remember they come back and they go, smoke out. And I go, that's a Roger. I said, I see goofy grape, meaning purple. Mm -hmm. And he goes, that's a negative. We put out banana. And I turn around and I see yellow smoke there. And I see goofy grape right here. Mm -hmm. So I call up the Chinook and I go, put it on a goofy grape. Because that's not our guys. Right. Think about it, they're Viet Cong and they're yeah. our North Vietnamese and they see a Chinook with a sling, oh, supplies, bring it in, yeah. shoot it down, we can capture the supplies. They caught it all right. Mm -hmm. Got I think I think we counted four or five crispy critters out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the sort of thing that, I, mean, I had a neat experience. I got to go up in a, I called it a push me, pull me Cessna. Had a propeller in the front, propeller in the back, it looked like a small flying box car. Mm -hmm. And we used to do targets, uh, mark targets for the um, aircraft coming, for, for the yeah, aircraft coming yeah. with the carriers. Right. That was kind of cool. I went on a couple of those. Because you see, I was in a position where I got to know all these guys. Yeah. Like the Air Force liaison. Mm -hmm. And he and I knew each other pretty well, and we'd joke around, and he'd say, I'll take you up, I'll take you. So he took me up a couple of times. I, I got to do some neat stuff. Mm -hmm. Without putting my like, uh, putting myself in a lot of immediate danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and mean, were you losing many aircraft in this period? But we did going out. Uh, Lam Song, uh, we lost a lot of aircraft, but that wasn't my concern because most of them were attached mm -hmm. to the Arvins. Right. But I knew we were losing. I mean, we lost a ton of aircraft in Lam Song Seven One Nine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just disaster. It was written all over. It was horrible. Yeah. Now, I mean, how much did you know about that operation before it started? Very little. Okay. We weren't involved other than to go up and cover right. the areas that the Arbans uh, had responsibility for before mm -hmm. that that took place. Yeah, and we went up to Nancy. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then um, did the, any of those places get attacked while, the Arbans, while you were there? Or? Mm, not really. Um, Closest we came at Nancy, I remember um, where Nancy was, if you stood up on the bunkers, you could see the road running right down mm -hmm. here. And the other side of the road and about a kilometer up, they caught uh, a sapper platoon in the open mm -hmm. and called in Cobra gunships to take care of it. And this was five or six o'clock at night and it was dusk. And I remember there were three or four Cobras on station, and they were, you know, circling, mm -hmm. and they'd come in, and they'd put the nose down, and you could see this pink exhaust coming out of the gun pods, and they uh, chewed up that sapper unit mm -hmm. with flechette rounds, which was just <coughs> cool. Yeah. Brutal as hell, but really cool. Sort of giant shotgun effect. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, the other thing is I remember... When we were up on Nancy, they brought in, via the road, 8-inch uh, SP, self-propelled, 8-inch mm -hmm. guns right. to support Lamsar. And, and those monsters shook like hell. Uh, I can remember they'd fire and rats would fall from the rafters of the bunker, dead from the concussion. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I was in, the, I, I was in my, uh, my office bunker uh, and I was right next to an ASA bunker, and I hear uh, thump, which is the sound of a mortar tip. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of seconds later, I hear whomp, 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 whomp. I hear incoming? Well, what do you do during incoming? You hide, but this one, so I go and stand up on top of the bunker. Not the smartest thing in the world to do. And I'm watch. I'm looking down into an Arvin mortar pit. Mm -hmm. and they're shooting mortars and I look out to where they're landing and there's a herd of water buffalo out there they were getting dinner Oh. 
I mean, half the time the mystery meat we had in, 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 in at the mess hall, we deemed as being water buffalo. That's what was indigenous. That was mystery meat preferable to sea rations. Oh yeah, oh yeah, no question. But the best of all were lerps. Loved lerps. <laughs> I mean, the chicken a la case <laughs> was just, just incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, we had a guy in uh, base defense, and uh, he was there. Well, I was there for about the first six months, and we became best friends. I mean, mm -hmm. I see him. You know, we've we've remained friends ever since then. We see each other a couple times a year. Man, he could scrounge anything, anything. Uh, I remember his D-Rose party, date eligible to mm -hmm. return from overseas. We had steaks and ham this and we had that. And, uh, I remember one of the officers, one of the brigade staff officers coming in and going, hey Frankie, where'd you get this? I don't know sir, it just showed up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you wanted anything, he could get it for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, and every unit has, if, if you remember, what was the movie, it was it The Longest Day where they escaped from the German prisoner of war camp? Uh, the Great Escape. The Great Escape, okay. Yeah. And James Garner played that role mm -hmm. of the scrounger, right. okay? That's what this guy was. Anything you wanted, no problem, I'll get it for you. Price for it, yeah. but I'll get it for you. Yeah, we sent a lot of different kinds of things to Vietnam, and Enterprise and people could find them. Yes, they could. Especially if you were on a large base like that. Yeah, especially right. if your parents sent you a care package. He was Italian, Frank was mm -hmm. Italian. And his parents would send him a care package with salami. <laughs> Oh man, just great stuff. He'd share it and trade it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was that simple. All right. Uh, now, looking over the course of, of, of your tour there, are other particular things that kind of stand out in your memory about what you saw, what you did? You know, I have a very interesting mind. My mind tends to bury a lot of bad stuff and really keep it down. I, I, I don't have weekly or monthly nightmares. About mm -hmm. once or twice a year, I'll have a screaming nightmare and I'll wake up. And it's usually the same thing, and then I wake up screaming, Frankie, get down. Um, the other things that stand out in my mind are good times. Mm -hmm. After General Harrison left, he was replaced by an uh, absolutely wonderful man by the name of David E. Grange, Colonel David E. Grange. He retired with three stars. Mm -hmm. His son also retired with three stars, okay? <clears throat> what a great down-to-earth guy. You could walk up to him, talk to him like I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> he was out near Fire Sport Base Jack, and I'll never forget, I had five days left in country. My turtle is in. I'm short, I'm so short I could sit on the edge of a dime, and my feet wouldn't reach the floor. <laughs> The, my only responsibility is to show up for the five o'clock briefing. Yeah. Five days left in country. And the bunker where we held the briefing was right next to his command pad. And I'm walking up by the wire next to the pad. His chopper is coming in. And he's screaming off the chopper, Pete, Pete, Pete. Oh, God, what's he on now? He lands. They pull two dead pigs. Wild boar. Mm -hmm. Off the chopper. He comes up to me. And this is the kind of relationship I had with him. Mm -hmm. He realized I was the only trained intelligence person in there, mm -hmm. in there. I used to go with him and he'd call me his intelligence guy. Not special assembly. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is my this is my intelligence guy. Pete, 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 come here. Yes, sir, what do you need? He said, We shot five pigs out near fire right outside Fire Sport Base Jack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Where are the rest of them? He said, they're out there, I want you to go get them. Said, no, wait, no, you gotta understand something, sir. I have five days left in country. No, I'm ordering you. You get on a chopper and you go out and get I said, sir, I don't have a flight jacket, I don't have a helmet, no weapon. Don't worry about it. Here's my helmet. What does he have on his helmet? Right here? Oh, well, it's a star, too. A little bird. A bird, a bird. It's a little colonel. Okay. Yeah. 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 He gives me his flak jacket, and what does he have here? A little bird. Okay. Gives me his 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 um, Remington, 870, because mm -hmm. that's what he and I both carried them over there. And he said, no, they chopper pilots know right where they are. They're going to sit down here. And he jump off the chopper. You're going to throw them on the chopper. We'll come back. We're going to have wild boar for you when you mm -hmm. de-roast. 
sure. I'm short. Do you under Don't worry about it. Go. Okay. And we go out there. I'm, never, uh, I'm in that scared since ripcord. We go out there and there's elephant grass, six foot elephant grass on the chopper lands. I find two of the three pigs I'm supposed to get through them on a chopper. I'm going to get back on the chopper. I trip on something. The third pig is under the 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 the, the skid of the helicopter. The skid of the helicopter. Okay, <laughs> so the helicopter got lifted up. Throw that pig on my back. I had a great great party. I can remember. I used to every two weeks go down to uh, Da Nang for an I Corps briefing, and I'd always come into your chopper and run down. I remember coming back once. We always flew right over High Bang Pass, and I remember we got a Vietnamese elk and brought it back, strung it up like this under the skids of the chopper. Um, those are the things I remember. I remember some of the parties we had. I remember a Christmas party that was just hysterical. Um, it was actually held on the 23rd of December because on the 24th, I came home for two-week leave. Mm -hmm. um, I took my r r in the spring in Bangkok. Uh, it was just, those are the things I remember. And, and the everyday stuff, I remember I worked the radios. <clears throat> and after Ripcord, it wasn't a lot. Right. Now, what was it like to go, basically, to get out of Vietnam for a while, whether to go home or to go to Bangkok? Really, de really decompressing. Mm -hmm. Okay, really learn what life is back, like back in the world. Uh, I actually landed back here. Um, I think it was December 26th mm -hmm. um, for two-week leave, and uh, that was a lot of fun for those two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of stories associated with that, you know, hooking back up with my best friend and his girlfriend going upstate New York to get drunk. His North mm -hmm. Jersey had a drinking age of 21. Yep. His girlfriend was not 21. He and I were both 21, but his girlfriend wasn't. So we'd go upstate New York to Perunas mm -hmm. and the Joker and the Ramapo Inn and the Mothers and all of those places <laughs> and get drunk. And then I would drive back because in his car because he was he and his girlfriend were too. Uh, it was just yeah, <laughs> you know stories like that. Um, a New Year's Eve party. My parents always had a huge New Year's Eve party. Frankie was back by that time and I invited him down. And my parents' New Year's Eve party was black tie with three or four piece orchestra and a uh, roast stuff. A roast pig with an apple mm -hmm. in its mouth, and just really, they did it upright. And was it okay to go back to Vietnam after yeah, that? Yeah, it was. Okay. It was, and I viewed it as uh, it was an incomplete job, mm -hmm. and I wanted to complete it. Right. Uh, I really. It sounds weird, but I'm not sure I really wanted to come home that soon, because. The job hadn't been done. Mm -hmm. And I'm different, okay? I know a lot of people don't have that attitude. Yeah. I know they don't. I don't know, it's just the way I was brought up. All right. Uh, and I guess another question I've got is that you're going around, you're, you're sometimes going into populated areas, into Da Nang, places like that. How much did you see, really, of the civilian population? Very little. Yeah. Very little. We were not really allowed to associate with the indigenous personnel out mm -hmm. of Camp Evans. I say I went to Da Nang, I went to the military facility right. at Da Nang, I did not get off that base. Okay. I did virtually no contact. A little bit with the, vil the village people outside the gate mm -hmm. at Camp Evans, I can't remember the name of the village, but mm -hmm. a little, uh, I, I did do some liaison with the village mayor or whatever he was mm -hmm. there, but not a lot. All right. So that's mostly still kind of outside of your experience. And mm -hmm. out in the field, there's just not a whole lot of civilians out there anyway. No. Yeah, no. Not, not in that area. No. So, you're kind of finished with that. All right. Uh, so now, then when do you come back to the States for good? Came back, um, I'm, I'm going to say mid-May of 71, mm -hmm. about 45 days early. All right. Uh, and then what do you do then after you get back? Uh, I had a month leave. I reassigned to uh, United States Army Intelligence Command, Fort Holliver, and I worked in the uh, Security Clearance Adjudication Center. Uh, I applied to be a special agent for United States Army Intelligence. Was accepted. Um, went out to Fort Huachuca, Arizona for training and was trained as a special agent for United States Army Intelligence. Okay. And so what does that actually entail? Um, we learn all about counterintelligence. Now, counterintelligence you also learn um, 
how to collect data. Not just, not just how to prevent your stuff from being caught, but how to collect data, run agent networks, all of that stuff. That's what we learn. And of course, with my background, I had a leg mm -hmm. up on it because I'd done some of that. Yeah. Um, you learn how to conduct interviews, both hostile and friendly. Mm -hmm. Hostile, and you learn how to um, how to investigate and pursue um, different crimes, i.e., um, sedition, um, sabotage. So we would do the investigations on those. And uh, from there, I was assigned to Garden City, Long Island, to run background investigations. In other words, go ring doorbells. You need mm -hmm. a security clearance, yep. we do a neighborhood check. We do a police records check and so on. <clears throat> All that is sent to the adjudication center where I had worked. And your case is adjudicated, and you're either granted or not granted a security clearance. Um, and I was at Garden City. It was interesting, because I got to Garden City in June. been a little early, it might have been April or May, and I was there for six months, October, they closed the office mm -hmm. in Garden City, and they reassigned me to Fort Hamilton, which is in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. right under the Baranzano Mayor's Bridge, because we had another office there, mm -hmm. and I report there, and he says, I've got too many agents, where's your home? I said, North Jersey, Ridgewood, he said, once you go home, we'll call you, <laughs> that was in October. So I spent the fall hunting pheasant with my girlfriend's father, just generally relaxing, bumming around, full pay. Mm -hmm. I get a call in December, and they say, how'd you like to go learn how to pick locks? I said, where? And they said, Fort Huachuca. I said, when? They said, January. I said, so let me, how long? And they said, two months. I said, so you're asking me if in the height of winter I want to leave the cold and snow of North Jersey and spend it in Arizona? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I said, yeah, of course. So I went out and did that, and mm -hmm. then they didn't have anything for me, so I wound up, uh, I didn't have an assignment. Mm -hmm. They said, you want to stay for the DACE training, Defense Against Sound Electronics. I, that, the one, first one I went through was DAME, mm -hmm. Defense Against Methods of Entry. It's lock picking is mm -hmm. what it is. Surreptitious entry. So I stayed for the DACE course too, and then they assigned me to Fort Riley, Kansas. And I did uh, some background investigations there, but then I, because of my Dane training, uh, I was a designated person to do penetration inspections, which are way cool. I mean, this is fun. You get to play. Um, you dress up, whatever. And you try to gain access to a restricted area. Um, I remember doing a penetration inspection of the G2 of the 1st Infantry Division, and it was not successful, which is wonderful news. <laughs> the bad part is that I spent 10 minutes face down spread eagle with a cocked 45 at the back of my head until they found, verified who I was, mm -hmm. okay? They did it right, mm -hmm. which is the good news. I did do some penetration inspections of Nike bases, because we had them back mm -hmm. in the 70s, out on Long Island, and they were cool. And I had some successful ones, and I had some that weren't successful. Um, and then, the, while I was at Riley, they sent me to uh, computer security. That was becoming the big thing, computer security. So they sent me to Anacosta Naval Air Station for a month to learn computer security. My instructor was none other than Grace Hopper. Now, a lot of people don't know who Grace Hopper is. When you have a computer and it has a glitch in it, it's called a bug. Mm -hmm. She's the one who coined that term because she built the first computer mm -hmm. that had tubes and everything else in Philadelphia. Right. And when it crashed, she went crawling through the computer, okay, and found a moth, mm -hmm. had shorted out one of the connections, mm -hmm. well, you can't call it a circuit when you've got tubes in it, and hence came the term bug. She coined that term. Uh, she's a pioneer in the computer mm -hmm. industry. She went on to work for, uh, uh, she was on the board at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation with Ken Olson, a sweetheart of a lady. She taught me computer, basic computer and computer security. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I got transferred to Fort Leonard Wood, 
and uh, interesting story there, I got involved in an organized crime investigation. By that time, Army intelligence was not handling background investigations anymore. There was an organization that had been set up called Defense Investigative Services, which had the in, uh, intelligence agents from all the services, and they'd go out and do the background mm -hmm. investigations until it turned derogatory. Once it turned derogatory, it got shipped back to the service mm. of origination. Yeah, I'm in my office one day, or, or I'm walking to my office one day, and uh, my boss said, there's a file on your desk, I want you to look at it. I said, okay. He said, don't do anything till you come talk to me once you're ready. I'm like, when there's a note on the front of the file saying, take no action on this case until you contact uh, a gentleman's name. IRS Intelligence, Springfield, Missouri, and I'm like, ooh, neat. <laughs> and I open it up, and this is a woman who had enlisted for a position with the Army Security Agency, requiring a TSSI clearance, crypto, all of that mm -hmm. stuff. Come to find out, she had been employed by organized crime running a brothel in Springfield. And at this moment, I'm going to have you pause because a woman who had apparently been running a brothel? Running a brothel down in Springfield. And so I read the file and uh, went in and talked to my seat, uh, my boss. And he said, you got to go down to Springfield and talk to the IRS. Okay. So I go down to Springfield. I'm not going to mention the gentleman's name. Mm -hmm. um, the gentleman was a native Oklahoman and the epitome of what you would think of a cowboy from Oklahoma. He stood 6'6", his shoulders were this wide, his waist was this big, he wore cowboy boots and chinos and a, and, and, and a western shirt. Just a wonderful, wonderful person. And he and I hit it off immediately, very, very well. So he filled me in on the whole thing and he said basically what it is is that you're walking right in the middle of an organized crime investigation involving Fort Leonard Wood. It is being contested right now, Fort Leonard Wood is, mm -hmm. by the Giordano family out of St. Louis and the Black Mafia out of Kansas City. They're both fighting over control because twice a month, now Fort Leonard Wood has basic training and AIT, mm -hmm. and it has a twice a month payroll of $2 million going in there, and you got these kids with nowhere to spend their money. So what is rampant is prostitution, drugs, and gambling. Mm -hmm. um, most of the law enforcement in that area was paid off. There were trailers that were blown up. There were gun battles out in the open. Um, basically what we found out is local police, uh, two towns, county, uh, and the local barracks of the Missouri State Highway Patrol, all on the take. Local FBI agent is running kitty porn. Um, absolutely incredible. Um, there, the cab cab company was running prostitutes on Fort Leonard Wood because there's no federal regulation against prostitution. There was a P Army private PFC cook who's driving a brand new Fleetwood every six months, mm -hmm. who is an integral part of this. I mean, it really was a very in-depth investigation. Um, and we, I did a report about that thick mm -hmm. with this agent from the IRS, and we went up and jointly presented it to the U.S. Organized Strike Force uh, Assistant Attorney General in mm -hmm. St. Louis, mm -hmm. uh, Organized Crime Strike Force, right. so on. Where else are we going to take it? Uh, you can't take it to the state police. Nope. Um, I mean, there was one night I spent with him because the mafia, organized crime, was building a facility at Lake of the Ozarks, building an R&R &R mm -hmm. house. With, mm -hmm. And one night we were up on a hill with binoculars watching him build this place. It was just weird. Um, and. I'm going to tell you that 75% of that report was civilian. You know, talking mm -hmm. about civilians, mm -hmm. not military. Yeah. 
Well, like most good people, I kept a copy of it, which was a huge mistake. That's a major violation mm -hmm. of Army regulations. We had an inspector general come down to go through our files. I thought I had pulled it out. He found it. I was given an Oracle 15, and at that point I basically decided, you know, I don't need to play these games. Mm -hmm. I'll get out of service. So I did. All right. Now, before that, you had basically extended or re-upped because you're... Yes. Um, after I got out of agent school, I was still on E5, I was stationed in Garden City, and they said, uh, we'll make you an E6. You need to extend for six months and then re-up. Mm -hmm. Ten grand? Sure. Why not? So I did. Mm -hmm. At that time, that's what I wanted to do. Okay. Now, by the time you, you get out, I mean, would you otherwise have stayed in for a, a career doing that kind of work, do you think? or I had given it thought. I, at that point, I was, what, 25 or so, mm -hmm. and uh, really didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I was enjoying myself. Mm -hmm. I was having fun until that, that time when, some, you know, that went, that went wrong, and I right. just said, you know, I don't need this. Okay. So, once you're out, what do you do? Um, I actually went into the publishing business, uh, but I went into it a little different aspect than my father did. Mm -hmm. My father sold textbooks and did textbooks, mm -hmm. textbook adoptions. Right. I went into periodical publishing from a sales standpoint, advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent 30 plus years selling advertising for um, uh, medical journals and high tech mm -hmm. uh, computer publications. And then I retired about five years ago uh, after having open heart surgery and my employer telling me I was too old to work there because she didn't really want any of the girls in the office to have to perform CPR on me if I had a heart attack. And I said, Karen, I've never had a heart attack. I mean, mm -hmm. what are you doing here? We just think you're too old. We're going to make it so you don't want to work here. And they did. Lovely. Yeah. Oh. So I'm retired. Been All retired right. for five years. Run a small antique business. Set up at an outdoor flea market twice a week, I have a ball. All right. Uh, to look back on your time in, in the service, how do you think that, that uh, affected you? What did you take out of it? I think before I went in the service, I had questions about the discipline that I got at home from my parents. The service reinforced what they were doing. The service said, Getting up, you know, not sleeping in all day or half the day or whatever isn't the way to do it. Get up, get your day started. Have a plan. It helped me get organized with my life. Um, it helped me learn how to communicate. Mm -hmm. I mean, communication is one of, the, one of the best things anybody can have today is the ability to make you understand mm -hmm. what, what's on my mind. Okay. Training I went through as, a, as an agent, who, what, where, when, why. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would write letters, sales letters, that were short to the point, here's why you should advertise with me, because of this, that, my boss would tear apart, well, you're not this and you're not that. I said, you know, do whatever you want. This is the way I am. You don't want me firing. You know? mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's probably a downside. I jumped a lot on jobs. Mm -hmm is because we used to have a saying, this is the way I'm going to do it. They don't like it, what are they going to do? Send me to Nam? Mm -hmm. Been there, done that. Can't be any worse than what I've already been through. And it's an attitude mm -hmm. that I had. And I changed jobs quite a bit um, simply because of my attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to put up with this stuff. And, and, it, and it holds true today. If I'm at a job, and you're the boss, and you tell me to do something, that's fine. But you know what? I have a choice. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do that. There's the door. Right. And I can walk out and leave. And it's also knowing your own worth, knowing that if you walk out that door, that's not the end of your life. Mm -hmm. You will find another job. I'm a survivor, mm -hmm. you know, like Frankie, like, like all of us that came home. We're survivors. We know how to do it because we've been there. Uh, it's hard to put into words. 
Um, I don't have, in my opinion, a lot of psychological problems. I have a little bit of survivor's guilt mm -hmm. because I was on that radio the night yeah. Alpha got hit. And I can't help but think, what would I have done? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm part of this unit. I could very easily have been assigned there. How would I have come home? <coughs> and how would I have how would I have handled it? Mm -hmm. And it's tough. Mm -hmm. I think about, I lost two very dear friends in Vietnam. One while I was there, one before I went. I haven't been to the wall. I'm thinking back on, on my way home Sunday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to really piss some people off and, you know, see if I can get my ass arrested. <laughs> yeah. um, it's just, that's the way, that's the way I am. That's the way I'm built. Um, I, like I said, I don't have the, as, at least I don't think I have as many psychological problems. Yeah, I mean, I mean, ultimately, you know, you, you went, you, you, you served, you, you came back, you know, you had a life, you contributed to society, and all, all of that kind of stuff, uh, which is actually what most guys who came back from Vietnam did. I mean, you have guys who have, you know, various levels of issues and so forth, but um, that we lose track of the fact that, you know, guys come back and you do pick up in different ways and go on. I came back and came out of the service when I did, and I got involved with living my life, mm -hmm. raising a family, <coughs> working every day, and buried, yep. buried everything about Vietnam. And then went through a divorce 11 years ago, 12 years ago, and had a lot of time now to think. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has come back. Uh, and a lot of it is the good stuff, because remember I told you, right. my mind right. buries bad stuff. and. Uh, I remember a lot of the good stuff, and I've become a lot more cognit cognitive of what I went through mm -hmm. and the effect that it had on me. I'm now very active with our chapter of Vietnam Veterans. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board of directors for our chapter, and uh, uh, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the fact that, I'm, that I serve, and I am most proud of who I served with, mm -hmm. which is the the guys that are here, the gentlemen right. of the 101st Airborne mm -hmm. Division. Um, all right. I almost feel like they carried me. Yeah, well, they ultimately you all worked together. Mm -hmm. That was part of the point. Mm -hmm. All right, well, you certainly have succeeded as a communicator. You've done a great job telling your story here, so I'd just like to close out by thanking you for taking mm -hmm. the time to do that. Very good.